Hi, good morning and welcome uh, to today's evidence-based health policy project briefing titled Farmers, Eaters, and Legislators, State Role in Food Systems and Nutrition Policy. I'm Sam Austin and I'm the EBHPP Project Director. I'm glad to see so many of you braved the cold today to join us. Uh, when we were sitting down planning this, obviously topic, moderators, speakers, we wanted to make sure that we planned it for one of the coldest days of the year. That was a big <laughs> priority for us, so I think we nailed that. Uh, but hopefully today's panel and discussion will uh, help us forget, at least momentarily, that it's about three degrees outside. <clears throat> Before we get started, I'd like to briefly introduce the, the evidence-based health policy project. The goal of our project is to con connect research uh, at the university and elsewhere into the health policy making process here at the Capitol and to broadly support evidence-based decision making in the public and private sectors. This goal is driven by the idea that uh, ongoing dialogue and the development of trust between policymakers and academic researchers can enhance and elevate the work of both. We work to serve as a resource here at the Capitol and a resource on campus through the convening of nonpartisan high quality events such as this one and facilitating interaction and mutual learning between the legislature and the campus in a variety of different venues. The project is a unique and formal partnership between the UW Madison uh, Population Health Institute, where I'm housed, the LaFollette School of Public Affairs uh, at UW Madison, and the Wisconsin Legislative Council. I'd like to recognize Hillary Shagger from LaFollette School, who's here today, uh, and Steve McCarthy from the Legislative Council. They are project partners and play an integral role in the success of this project, so thanks for, for being here today. I'd also like to recognize Rochelle Andre to my left, our project assistant. A student at the LaFollette School uh, does an incredible job of making sure things run smoothly and we all look, we all look good up here. Uh, the project is made possible by the support, the support of our funders, which include the Wisconsin Partnership Program at the UW School of Medicine and Public Health, the UW Institute for Clinical and Translational Research, also known as ICTRCAP, the UW, and the UW Madison Chancellor's Office. Uh, we thank them for enabling us to convene venues such as this one and letting us uh, connect research into the health policy making process. We developed these events with input from our Legislative Advisory Board, uh, which is a bipartisan group of legislators that represent a range of perspectives on health issues. Our current board membership includes Representative Joan Balweg, who is our moderator today, uh, Deb Colsty, who is in attendance, um, Daniel Reamer, Jesse Rodriguez, Joe Sanfilippo, Paul Tittle, and Senators Mary Lozick, Devin Lemahieu, Mark Miller, and Leah Vukmir. I truly appreciate their engagement in this project, so thanks for being here. I'd also like to recognize Representative Sandy Pope, who is in attendance as well today. As you can see, we'll have video coverage of this event, uh, both through Wisconsin Eye and through the instructional communication system at UW Extension. Uh, for those of you joining on the ICS webcast, um, you'll see that you'll be able to enter questions for our panel, which I will read at the question and answer session uh, at the end of the end of the briefing. And whether you're joining remotely or here in the room, I hope that the t uh, social media savvy amongst you will join the conversation on Twitter using the ha hashtag EBHPP. For those of you in attendance today, you'll see that there was a, I hope you all grabbed a folder on your way in. Uh, there's several documents inside. There's today's agenda, uh, biographies, biographies of all our speakers, and a list of further resources if you want to dive deeper into these topics. Uh, there are also three handouts giving an overview of the EBHPP, the Population Health Institute, and Health Tide, which is a core component of the Obesity Prevention Initiative at UW-Madison. And finally, you'll, you'll see a green evaluation sheet that we hope you'll take a few moments uh, as we go to fill out. Uh, we put it, put it on green paper today. They're usually pink. We thought it would be an appropriate thing for our farm to institution discussion. Uh, the juxtaposition of the green and the red ink gives it sort of a festive look as well, which is a nice perk. Um, we aim to be as responsive as possible. We can't do that without feedback from, from our audience. Uh, and I've authorized Rochelle to chase down and tackle anyone who doesn't fill out the evaluation. Okay. And she's quite fast, so <laughs> consider yourselves warned on that. To put today's topic into a little bit of context, um, the most recent issue, issue of the Wisconsin Medical Journal, the November 2016 issue, uh, deals exclusively with the problem of obesity in our state and the work of the Wisconsin Obesity Prevention Initiative, which is funded by the Wisconsin Partnership Program. Uh, in addition to presenting research indicating that Wisconsin's obesity rate is actually higher than uh, previously measured, uh, most current numbers prove that was about 31%. Research in that up, uh, issue suggests it's closer to 39%. Uh, the issue emphasizes the importance of multi-sector community level uh, efforts to address the problem of obesity. And today's panel fits very well into that framework. Food systems refer to the network of food production, distribution, consumption, and waste management. And public policies in this area that can help address issues of access to healthy foods include 
farm to institution and farm to school programs, urban agricultural initiatives, and community gardening. Uh, as an aside, uh, and just want to mention the irony is not lost on us that we convened a briefing on access to healthy foods and provided you all with a breakfast buffet of pastries and bananas from Costa Rica. Um, we actually did look into the possibility of including some uh, locally grown products into our, into our buffet, uh, but the res cons uh, constraints of our catering agreement made it not possible. Um, and branding that perhaps a farm to legislature initiative wasn't really in the, in the works. Um, that fact, though, is instructive, that structures matter, uh, and that all the steps can do connecting producers to consumers of, of healthy foods uh, need to align to get these policies right. And informing and educating on what these policies and programs look like when they're done right is the goal of today's panel. With that, I'll hand it over to today's moderator, Representative Joan Balwig. Representative Balwig has represented Wisconsin's 41st Assembly District since 2004, following terms as an alder and mayor of Marcusan. She served on multiple committees in this session, including the Committee on Mental Health Reform, the Committee on Colleges and Universities, and is the co-chair of the Joint Legislative Council. She's the owner of an agricultural equipment business, and we are very excited to have her involved today. Uh, she will introduce each of our speakers, and we'll call an audience member questions at the end of the briefing, so please hold your questions until that time. Uh, thanks, Representative Ball, again, and take it away. Thank you very much. And um, first, uh, one little piece of housekeeping that um, uh, wasn't mentioned. Uh, we are on Wisconsin Eye, and we are being broadcast. So please uh, make sure you check your phones. Um, otherwise, we'll probably hear whatever Christmas jingle you made a, as a ringtone for, um, for this time of year. So please check your phones. Um, I think it's interesting that I was asked to moderate this because farmers, eaters, and legislators, well, I can fit in all of those categories. Um, I obviously am a legislator, and I very much value uh, our partnership with um, uh, UW and have been a real advocate for um, uh, uh, encouraging our committees and uh, uh, the, the um, uh, UW to bring their information and their research uh, into the, the legislative fold. So I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to head this one off. Um, farmers, it was mentioned that um, I've been in an agribusiness now for uh, just over 40 years, uh, working with um, actual agricultural producers in a farm equipment business. And my district is all about uh, agriculture and um, uh, rural. And finally, um, uh, li I, like many of you, am an eater. So with that, I hope that all of us will be able to uh, uh, learn a lot uh, from uh, this farmers, eaters, and legislators, our food systems and nutrition policies as we move forward. Now, our first speaker today will be uh, Dr. Jed Cahoon. Uh, he is an interim associate dean for extension and outreach for UW-Madison's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the program director for the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension at UW Extension. Dr. Cahoon is a professor specializing in fruit and vegetable production, and his works <coughs> focus on the intersection of agricultural systems and natural resource management. So welcome, Dr. Cahoon. Uh, please proceed, and um, uh, all presenters will be staying here on the uh, podium to do their presentations. And uh, as Sam mentioned, questions will come following everyone's uh, presentation. Dr. Kuhn. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Balwig, for having us here today. And thank all of you for uh, joining us on this very cold uh, December day. On the face of it, it may sound a bit perverse to be excited about being here to talk to you about uh, health-related and hunger-related issues in our state. But my positive energy for the subject and my interest in being here today is really founded on a view that I think we're very close to a solution. And with supportive policies that create partnerships between our agricultural strengths and our food systems, we can get there. And we're not that far from, from a viable solution. So with that context uh, today, I'll offer some pieces that I think we can work on together that will get us there. And I think it'll complement very well what we hear from our panelists at different scales of agricultural production and uh, processing. So with that in mind, I'll give you a bit of an overview of where we'll head in the next 25 minutes or so. We'll start with an overview of Wisconsin agriculture. 
Uh, we, have, we are, of course, a very agrarian state, but as I'll show you, very few of us are involved in agriculture or food production. So I think it might serve us well to have a contextual background for where uh, our food comes from in this state. We'll talk about hunger and nutritional insecurity in our state in particular. And then we'll talk uh, about uh, solutions across scales, uh, from farm to school and field to food bank. And I'll conclude from some of my evidence-based experiences, some of the lessons from that road and uh, growth opportunities that we might see working together in partnership. So let's start with a little agricultural context. Of course, we know this is America's dairy land, but we have some tremendous strengths in very nutritious food products within our state's borders. If we look at our ranking across the uh, country, of course, uh, we're number two in milk production, number one in cheese and dry whey for human food consumption. Corn for silage, we produce 15% of the country's uh, corn for silage. Number one in oats. And then in some of the pieces that I work with in my uh, pro professor uh, duties, uh, a lot of people don't realize that we're number one in cranberry production. In fact, we produce nearly 60% of the country's uh, cranberries within the state's borders. Sweet corn, green peas, and snap beans uh, were very highly ranked within the uh, country, producing 43% of the nation's uh, snap beans in 2015. So we have tremendous strength right within our borders of our state, and we have a supportive infrastructure to connect that to markets, including hunger and health-related uh, solutions. As far as our uh, economic impact, of course, agriculture is a major player within the state. We have 68,900 farms in the state. Uh, that's down 100 over a year prior, so we're still losing farms, but not at the rate that we had uh, in the, the agricultural crises in the past, such as in the late 1970s. And with that, we have a tremendous economic impact in Wisconsin, an $88.3 billion dollar, uh, industry, including $18.6 billion dollars in labor, of course, an important part of our uh, growth capacity within the state and providing employment solutions. That accounts for over 400,000 jobs or 10% of Wisconsin employment, including Representative Balwig's uh, business. <clears throat> there are a few pieces about agriculture, though, that I think a lot of people aren't aware of uh, that are important to bring to the table when we talk about scale of solutions across uh, different agricultural uh, production areas. There's a lot on this slide, but I want to highlight just a couple of points. Number one, in 2011, 97% of U.S. farms were family operations. We hear a lot about industrial agriculture. Farming itself is still 97% family owned. And even the largest farms are predominantly family run. Why is that important? If you focus on the next sentence, 8% of U.S. farms account for 60% of the value of production. So it's a major player in solutions, and because of that efficiency, it's an affordable solution also. So it's one that we need to keep in mind, and it is still a family solution based in our rural production areas across the state of Wisconsin. It's rather amazing that that amount of food is produced on so few farms, particularly if we look at agricultural employment. Again, a lot on this slide, but if you focus on the blue line from the upper left-hand corner down to the bottom right, that's agricultural employment since 1910. And if you look over that time period, about 35% of our population was involved in agricultural employment 100 years ago, and that's down to between 1% and 2% at this point. So 1% to 2% of our population is producing our food. So that offers, again, a, a look into the type of scale that we might employ to offer health-related and hunger-related uh, solutions. We're relying on very few people to do so. Amazingly, with that context in mind, our food is still the least expensive in the world. The USDA does a survey of about 85 countries and looks at their uh, consumer expenditures on food, alcohol, and tobacco, 
In the U.S., we spend just over 6% of our con consumer expenditures on food. That's been relatively constant over the years, despite uh, what you might hear in the press about increasing food prices. We spend about 2% on alcohol and tobacco. If we look at our neighbors in Canada and Mexico to the north and south, 9% in, in uh, Canada, 23% of consumer expenditures are on food in Mexico. And that ranges in the survey of 85 countries all the way up to uh, maybe some less developed parts of the world, Kenya, Nigeria, over 50% of their consumer expenditures are on food. Amazingly, in this survey, nine of the surveyed countries spend more on alcohol and tobacco than we do on food in this country. And let's put that in context of hunger and health-related uh, issues. If we focus on uh, Wisconsin and the uh, map the meal gap from Feeding America, a wonderful website that you can explore looking at your counties and districts uh, to see what the uh, food insecurity rate is very locally across the state of Wisconsin and the country. If we look at that, uh, at the uh, food insecurity rate across the state is, is about 12%. Uh, even getting past recessionary times, we have a number of families and households, even in rural areas, it's not just an urban problem, uh, where we have high rates of food insecurity. Food insecurity is a relative reference that USDA and others use to indicate the difficulty in making choices between buying food, paying for rent, paying medical bills, or on a cold day like this, paying your heat bill. And that's even more concerning if we look at the number of people or the percentage of children in food insecure households in our state. That all adds up to a cost in a recent Brandeis University a uh, survey of $2.68 billion per year because of food insecurity in Wisconsin. And that's related to illness, depression, poor educational outcomes, reduced earnings, uh, private hunger-related charity type work. That costs each citizen in our state of Wisconsin over $500 per year. So take $2.68 billion and when we refer to policies and public support for hunger and health-related solutions, Imagine what we could do with $2.68 billion. There's an amazing amount of work uh, that we can do that will resolve this uh, situation and cost us less, uh, even in our taxpayer-supported efforts. So there are a few different ways that we might look at this, farm to school, farm to institution, or another uh, way that I'll outline in Field to Food Bank. The first two my colleagues will uh, talk about in more depth, so I'm going to focus on, on the uh, third solution, which is a bit unique to our state. Really, Field to Food Bank is a local solution to a local problem, and it began very locally. Field to Food Bank began at a food processor uh, meeting a number of years ago where I sat next to one of our local producers of uh, diversified vegetable production, and on the other side of me was one of the food bank uh, folks that secures food for their operation. We are talking about a particular carrot field that I was involved in in research on this grower's farm. And I asked what was the outcome of, of that carrot production. This was a wonderful year, high yielding. Agriculture is, is a game of risk. Some years you plant, you get less yield. Some years you plant, you get more. But you can't forecast that when you put the seed in the ground. In that particular year, the carrots yielded so much that the processor couldn't handle the capacity of that double the average yield. And unfortunately, some of those carrots froze in the ground. And the food bank, uh, food secure on the other side, dropped his fork and said, what do you mean? How much is this? We did a back of the napkin calculation, and it was over 200,000 cans of carrots that were frozen in this field. An amazing capacity. All the energy was put into growing it. We couldn't get to the finish line because of over-average yields, the bounty of a great Wisconsin harvest. And that's where food, Field to Food Bank uh, began and grew from there in cooperation with Second Harvest of Southern Wisconsin, uh, the University of Wisconsin, and some work by Cummins Filtration to develop a logistics system so that we could overcome those hurdles, put the logistic pieces together across company chains, growers, processors, uh, trucking companies, etc., so that when one is 
in the narrow part of the funnel, maybe we call another and put those pieces together in different ways across solutions that hadn't been tried in the past. So we have a very in-depth logistics piece to be able to track this efficiently and uh, figure out the, the responsibilities and capabilities across multiple operations. And with that, the program really took off based on the generosity of Wisconsin agricultural producers. 2012 was our test pilot. It was about 450,000 pounds or so. And that's been scaled up and hit a nice stable platform at this point in 2016 so far uh, the program has captured over two million pounds of food and that's included very nutritious sources snapping sweet corn peas carrots potatoes a lot of those pieces i emphasized in the beginning as our strengths in wisconsin agriculture but they're also strengths in nutritious solutions to hunger uh, and health related issues some of the folks involved in this, in fact, are Representative Balwig's uh, neighbors, Alsom Produce and Farms, mm -hmm. a, a family-owned operation that's very committed uh, and generous in providing a solution uh, and a player in this program. So with that in mind, I'll offer uh, some lessons from the road and then uh, one piece of the solution that we might not typically think of. Uh, number one, agri Wisconsin's agricultural diversity is our strength. We are a major player in food security across the nation. The system has become very efficient, and those that are still involved in agriculture have found a way to do it in a way that's economical and provides a bountiful harvest. With that in mind, there's a spot for everyone in ending nutritional insecurity. The Field to Food Bank program that I shared works at a large scale. It offers canned produce in a less perishable format that can be stored and distributed uh, in a larger scale. But that doesn't mean there isn't a spot at the farmer's market or in farm institution or in the schools uh, for every agricultural player to be a part of this solution. We need everybody on board uh, to be able to get this done. Agriculture is very unpredictable and perishable, but this can be addressed. For some reason, I think there's been an idea that uh, some of the less perishable products, such as those that are canned or frozen, number one, aren't nutritious, and number two, aren't a solution in ending hunger. We're extremely good at it in, in, in the state of Wisconsin. It's efficient, it's affordable, and it's very nutritious. Uh, and they can be part of this multifaceted solution, fresh when possible. Obviously, we see that in what we're able to secure for the session today. And less perishable when we need to get it in a format. And also in that final food mile to places where maybe they don't have refrigeration or uh, the ability to handle fresh products, including uh, the knowledge to be able to cook and uh, utilize them in nutritious ways. In order to be efficient, one piece I learned from our uh, Field to Food Bank uh, partners, when we sat around that initial table, there were five or six of us at a lunch table in Hancock and uh, Wisconsin. And when I looked around that table, we had over 150 years of agricultural experience. We're good at what we do, as I mentioned, and what they pointed out to me is that we need to make these solutions invisible within our existing production systems. If we have this efficiency, why try to duplicate it? One of my dreams early on was to buy a, a food truck and process a food locally and distribute it right back. I still think that could be a solution, but there are other ways to look at that. We also looked at purchasing a closed down uh, processing plant, again, not too far uh, from Representative Balwig's home. And uh, retailering it for use in field to food bank and what the processors around that table pointed out to me is that we could run 200,000 pounds of carrots locally in four hours through a processing plant why invest 30 million in building or mothballing or taking out of mothballs of a, 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 a shutdown processing plant when they could do it very easily for us and be a partner in the solution so make it invisible within the existing system. We need to keep in mind what people enjoy eating. And my uh, food bank partners in the room uh, will attest that I was very green in that knowledge uh, to begin with. And I learned very quickly uh, that 
what we provide being culturally appropriate and also uh, being able to be processed or prepared at home with that knowledge, recipes, whatever it might be, uh, or even uh, access to a kitchen, that's important is how nutritious the food is. It's only nutritious if you consume it, right? So <laughs> we have to make sure that we're producing something that's culturally appropriate. I'm pretty sure I could source red beets from now until the cows come home. My kids aren't eating them. I'm sorry to my <laughs> beet producing friends. Uh, so it could be part of the solution, but we can't rely on red beets as the ultimate solution to hunger and health. And finally, the piece that I'll close on, food waste isn't typically a farming problem. And part of this field to food bank process, we tracked carrots from the production field into the can and waste was less than 1%. The 1% are pieces you don't want to eat, rotten carrots, sand, other byproducts that tagged along in the harvest equipment. It wasn't consumable food at that point. So that's less than 1% waste, and I don't even know if I want to call it waste because it's not really consumable. On the other end of the equation, though, one of the solutions that we need to focus on as a society is the fact that we waste a tremendous amount of food, and one of our solutions is, in fact, a pile of garbage. So I work a lot in sustainable fruit and vegetable production, quantifying metrics like water and carbon footprint, the linchpins of society and food production moving forward. And we spend over 90% of our consumptive water use in food production. Water is going to be one of the greatest challenges for my kids moving forward across the world. Moreover, over 80% of the US uh, carbon footprint per year for food consumption is in agricultural production. There's a lot of focus on local food, food miles, etc. The final piece from where you purchase the food to taking it home accounts for about 4% of the US carbon footprint uh, related to food. The distribution from a processor or farm to direct market is about 11% of the carbon footprint related to food. Over 80%, 83% of the carbon footprint is in agricultural production itself. So local food, again, is part of that solution, but a lot of this happens within the uh, field if we're looking for a carbon uh, footprint solution. So let's relate that to food waste. We waste 160 billion pounds of food each year. Per capita, food waste increased 50% since 1974. If you have an interest in the subject, I suggest uh, Jonathan Bloom's American Wasteland is a very interesting read on the subject. And in that, Jonathan Bloom interviews a Harvard business professor talking about food waste related to under other industries this professor had worked with. And he said this is really akin to buying three shirts, throwing two out before you wear them, and wearing the third. For some reason, this is acceptable when it comes to food. So if we look at landfills, a lot of pressure on disposing of food, of course. Food is second to paper, and actually in some reports that I've seen, it's past paper in inputs to landfills. In 2008, the state of Pennsylvania received food waste from 24 states in Puerto Rico. Now that part is perverse. That's a very odd system in which we're working. And with that, about 40% of the available calories that we produce are wasted. So if we go back to the water, for example, or carbon footprint, the easiest solution to me is to not throw our food away. Consume what we produce and what we put the energy into doing uh, from the beginning. So much of the agricultural waste is uh, based on consumer pickiness, size, uniformity, appearance, but not taste. When you go into the supermarket and pick out an apple, you don't take, a, I hope you don't, take a bite out and then put it back on the shelf. You look at it, and if it's blemished, most people bypass it. We're a picky population. <laughs> There's a great example in American Wasteland from uh, Salinas Valley lettuce. I'll pick on that, not uh, anything related to uh, Wisconsin at this point. They did a survey in that where they found 90% of the field is harvested, 10% of the field is bypassed, as we call it in the processing industry. That's equivalent to 15,300 acres of bypass lettuce. 13 million pounds of lettuce not harvested. 
I can tell you from working in vegetable production, the majority of that has what they call tip burn. What do they have in California? A lot of sun. It scalds the top of the leaves once in a while, particularly when it's dry out. Do you eat the outside leaf of a head lettuce? Most people don't, but we don't even sell it because nobody will buy it because of that pickiness about the outside appearance of the leaf that we're not even consuming to begin with. Uh, so again, a lot of this isn't based on, on nutrition or on appearance, or on taste, excuse me. It's based almost exclusively on appearance. So in closing, uh, in terms of how we can enhance these partnerships between our tremendous agricultural strength and generosity in this agrarian state and our health-related local issues, rural and urban, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to harness our supporting and existing energy working on multiple solutions. All these folks up at the front of the room are here because we have an interest in ending hunger, and I'm assuming you do also by being in the room. We have projects underway that we can support through healthy policies and partnerships uh, to get there. Number one, we need to maintain healthy agriculture. And of course, that plays into everything related to environmental regulation, uh, to supporting uh, work on, on roads and transportation to get these products to the solutions. Uh, we need to maintain an infrastructure in the state that not only maintains but builds our agricultural strength because we are an area of national food security. We need to make donations easy, whether it be money to support a program like Invest in Acre where you can donate at the elevator a non-direct consumed product like corn or soybeans and have that funding be used to secure uh, directly consumed nutritious products like what I've shown you in Field to Food Bank or Farm to School programs. Make those donations seamless, easy, and even support them publicly uh, so that we're able to get to that. Uh, develop the logistics. There are still some barriers that we haven't overcome. Uh, one of those that we talked about uh, in the back of the room as we uh, prepared for the session is food safety. There's a lot of national policy coming on board about food safety, but it's still a bit nebulous and open to interpretation. Let's support our agricultural producers so their hesitancy in being involved in the solution isn't based on a misunderstanding or poorly written legislation on food safety. That can't be our hurdle. Support the current efforts, such as you'll hear from my colleagues up here today. And finally, as I mentioned, in culturally appropriate and nutritious foods, Let's market nutrition. I don't think we market nutrition as well as we market some other products that you may see in the press or, or uh, in different uh, venues and such. Let's make nutrition as popular as what you see from other food production sources uh, so that it is a viable solution at home in the kitchen. It reduces waste. It offers a solution to hunger and health-related issues. So in closing, I think we're close. We're not that far off. We can do this, and we have tremendous strength in this state to connect our partnerships between the producers and healthy uh, food solutions. With that, I look forward to hearing from my colleagues about the other scales, and then we'll entertain questions at the end. Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuhn. I w it was interesting that you, you <clears throat> brought up the, the, uh, the, the number of corporate farms. I work with a lot of corporate farms every day in my, in my day <coughs> job. Um, um, because corporate farms are more of an organizational tool than uh, what we think of as, as corporations. Most of the corporation, corporation farmers that I work with are fathers and sons or brothers or in some cases uh, uh, dad, son, and, and grandson. So they are truly um, family farms, but they're working uh, under, under a corporation organizational. And you mentioned the uh, you mentioned the um, the lettuce. I can give you a great example, or maybe a poor example. Um, in our own area, I've seen uh, many uh, a field of peas that has been bypassed because the uh, uh, when they test them for quality before they even harvest them, uh, they see that it isn't going to meet their quality needs. And I think that's one of the reasons we see so much. Um, uh, uh, irrigation in uh, vegetable producing areas because they're trying to uh, they're trying to uh, uh, outthink mother nature and uh, put the right amount of water on products 
as they're growing so that they can maintain that quality. Very interesting. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kuhn, and we will, we will open up for questions at the end of all the presentations. Next coming up is uh, Vanessa Harrell. She's our next speaker, Farm to Institution Outreach Specialist at the UW-Madison Center for Integrated Agricultural Systems. Her current projects focus on enabling institutions such as schools, early care centers, hospitals, and universities to purchase and serve Wisconsin and regionally grown foods. So thank you and uh, welcome, Vanessa. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Representative Balwig, and Jed, thank you for such a wonderful overview of Wisconsin agriculture. I think that really starts our conversation off well. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you also to the Evidence-Based Health Policy Project for this opportunity today. Um, it's nice to see a lot of friends in the room and hopefully some people who are new to the concept of farm to institution and farm to school. So what is the Center for Integrated Ag Systems? Probably one of the longest titles on the UW campus, CIAS for short. There's a description on the screen so I don't read it, I won't read it all for you, but um, our center works on a lot of issues using participatory research with farmers and with eaters, looking at um, a lot of ways to increase sustainable agriculture, including beginning farmers, grazing systems, organic ag, perennialization, and farm to institution, which we have mentioned a number of times today, and I work in the farm to institution desk at the office. So what is farm to institution? Generally speaking, it is the concept of taking our Wisconsin grown agricultural products and getting them into cafeterias. That might be something like school food service. It might be what's fed to a table of kids at an early care center or at a preschool, maybe at a hospital like we'll hear a lot more about today, or even possibly a college, university, or a prison. And it's a lot different than the food you buy at the grocery store and that you prepare and you serve on your own because as you can see in that picture on the left, it's institutional cooking. It's something that happens in a large kitchen with a staff and a variety of equipment to go along with it, or in some cases, lack of equipment. So we're talking about a different system, a different scale than you might see when you eat out at a restaurant or when you're eating at home. And it comes with a lot of really interesting challenges, but also a lot of really great opportunities for feeding healthy Wisconsin-grown foods <coughs> to our children and to other eaters in the community, and also creating new and really sustainable, valuable markets for Wisconsin agricultural producers. And a lot of the conversation today, although it's about farm to institution in general, we'll look at it through the lens of farm to school. And farm to school is really looking at getting this local food, this Wisconsin grown food, into the K-12 schools. Um, so that's the lens we'll use, but we can think about it more broadly in terms of all institutions in the state. So what is farm to school? Farm to school is lots of things. We get phone calls. Can I join the farm to school program? Can you send me a kit? We don't have a kit. We use what we call comprehensive farm to school in Wisconsin. So that's the idea of procurement, finding, sourcing, purchasing, preparing, serving, taste testing local foods in the cafeteria. So that's all about the farmer side, the buying, the serving, the getting kids to eat it. And Jed, I really appreciated how you said it's not nutritious unless we're actually eating it. And that's a big challenge in school food is getting kids to really look at what's being served and wanting to eat it. And farm to school is really a solution on lots of fronts, including really delicious, wonderful looking meals. And then the education that supports kids eating maybe unfamiliar fruits and vegetables. There's also the education piece, and that's curriculum-based and experiential. So looking through a food lens or a food system lens when we're talking about nutrition or science, but it's also using food or a school garden to learn about math or language arts. And then we have school garden and experiential education, and a school garden is one of the best classrooms outside that you will ever see. Kids just light up when they have the opportunity to plant seeds and watch them grow. And we are seeing, and the research is starting to show, that when kids are involved in learning how plants grow, growing them some, themselves, and harvesting them, 
they are way more likely to eat that red beet that might be a unfavorable or unfamiliar item earlier on in the learning process. So school gardens are a great, great activity, and they go along with other uh, experiential learning things like field trips to farms or bringing chefs into the classroom. So lots of different ways to talk about food and our food system and what we grow in Wisconsin, ultimately with the goal of getting kids to eat the nutritious food on their plate. So um, pictures tell a much better story than I can sit here and talk to you about. So Wisconsin foods are farm to school. Um, we're talking about the health impacts today, but really this is a market opportunity for growers. Helping growers have a really stable institutional market that they can get a large volume of product into. Um, you can see that through the Harvest Medley blend, which is that colorful root vegetable blend in those plastic cups, as well as um, a large processing. The picture in the upper right hand corner is a school food service preparing a significant proportion of ratatouille from local product when it's fresh and in season to be served, frozen and served through the uh, school year, throughout the year. So also school gardens, and just showing you the myriad of ways that you can engage kids in learning about where food comes from and the actual activity of growing, testing, snacking, harvesting, and learning about that food, and that the education piece really can be incorporated throughout the school day. So farm to school has grown tremendously in Wisconsin. You can see on this amazing map that is now a couple years outdated, but we're working on a new version. All of those dark green areas, those are Wisconsin counties that are engaged in some kind of farm to school. So they're doing local procurement. They have a school garden. They're doing some kind of activity that they recognize as farm to school. Um, and then the white areas are not doing anything, and the gray areas are um, haven't reported. So there is always the potential that there's a lot more going on that we know about and the light green is planning to. So you can see that throughout the state there is definite engagement in farm to school activity. Um, we also learned recently through a survey of the National Farm to School Network that there's at least 113 early care and education sites. So those are preschools, daycare centers, head starts, anybody serving the zero through five population that are engaged in some kind of farm to early care and education. So that's farm to school for our youngest eaters. And it's really exciting. That's actually the highest number of responses from any state in the country. So it really shows how Wisconsin is at the leading edge of incorporating these healthy activities into places where kids eat and learn. I will not read this slide to you, but we have a really comprehensive set of values that are the foundation for Farm to School. And Farm to School has been in Wisconsin for, we realize we've been saying 10 years, and now it's 15 years of grassroots organizations and institutions really working on getting this system of education and local food to work together. And we all came into this because it's something that felt good. Anybody who's been in a garden with a kid or seen a kid eat kohlrabi for the first time and light up because they're like, this is actually good. You see that there's something good there, but we didn't necessarily have the peer-reviewed journal articles to show it. And now we do, and that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today. More specifically, the goals of Wisconsin Farm to School really are about kids and farmers and communities. It's a three-legged stool, it's a triangle, and it doesn't make sense without representing all of those groups when we're talking about what Farm to School is, why we do it, and who it benefits. And so digging a little deeper, why? Why is school the right place for looking at nutrition and looking at Farm to School and markets for growers? It's because school-aged children eat between 19 to 50 percent of their calories in the school setting, and it might be, in some cases, significantly more. There's also a lot of money that is spent on food by Wisconsin schools, $175 million. So if you look at that as the opportunity for local markets, even if we can translate a small percent of that to our Wisconsin growers, it's a big opportunity. There's also a lot of meals that are served in our schools each year, and that's just meals. That number isn't looking at snacks, it's not looking at breakfasts, it's not looking at suppers, those are just lunches. And about 51% of those 88.8 million lunches were served to students who qualified for free lunch. So when we look at need, when we look at vulnerable populations, you're looking at over 40 million lunches served to kids who are really in need and who are looking to their school environment as a place to get a healthy meal, not just the education and the nutrition that gets them through their learning environment. 
And in Wisconsin, we serve just over half a million meals a day. So what are the benefits? What are we learned? We're, we've been really lucky that over the past five to six years, there has been a lot of research about farm to school and its impacts for students, student health achievement, and also for farmers and communities. And the results are coming in. And we're very glad to see that all of those things that were really the warm and fuzzies that started us out in this are actually true. So when you look at student benefits around nutrition, Kids are choosing healthier options in the cafeteria. They are consuming more fruits and vegetables. They are more willing to try new foods, which when it comes to that red beet is really, really valuable talking about getting folks into what is nutritious and what is healthy. And kids are more willing to put more fruits and vegetables on the tray. And it also offsets some of the other, what we might consider less healthy foods that kids might be consuming. And that second bullet point is asterisk because a lot of this research has actually come out of Wisconsin, done at UW, and um, it's evaluation on the AmeriCorps Farm to School program that's happened in the state and some other farm to school programs in the state. And what they really saw is that that increase in consumption of fruit and vegetables is among the most vulnerable children. So the kids who are eating already the least amounts of fruits and vegetables and who are more likely to be free or reduced lunch, those are the, those are the kids who actually are most impacted and end up consuming more fruits and vegetables. So not only is this working, but it's sort of helping support the kids who might be needing it most. The benefits extend beyond just the nutrition piece, so we have increased understanding of agriculture, Wisconsin agriculture, where our food comes from, why it's valuable to support our farmers, and things as simple as seasonality. When does that carrot grow? Um, when does that pumpkin grow? And why it's important to be tuned into these things. School gardens boost kids' physical activity, and there is this growing body of evidence that's showing that farm to school boosts academic achievement. So these are things that we can get really excited about and help us stand behind farm to school. We look a lot at how this helps kids, but this also helps the school environment. School food gets a bad rap. And it doesn't deserve it because school food staff really are the hearts and the champions of schools in many, many ways. Not only are they working really hard with limited resources to serve kids who they genuinely love and care about, but they're doing it with very little. And so Farm to School is this great morale booster where there's something good to talk about when it comes to school food and what's happening in the cafeteria. So it's really good for morale. And there's also some research that shows that farm to school programs help improve um, nutritional and wellness outcomes for school nutrition staff and teachers who are learning to prepare new foods or maybe having access to healthier foods at a salad bar that they are now eating at at lunch and sitting down and possibly eating with students, which is a, another amazing way to be using the cafeteria as a classroom of this watching your teachers model healthy eating. So there's lots of other school benefits. And of course, the farmer benefits. And we recognize that this is the area where we are wanting to do a lot more research so that we know how to talk about the benefits of farm to school when it comes to growers. Some research that's happened nationally shows that there's a 5% income boost to farmers who step into farm to school. And we also really see that there's a community relationship. So a grower might sell their product to a school, their farm name or logo shows up on the school menu, or um, they come in and they do a presentation, and then they report back you know, they're at the farmer's market, a kid will bring his dad up to the market and say, Dad, we ate these carrots or we taste tested these carrots from this farmer. And so there's this wonderful kind of marketing that's happening for the grower and this connection that's being built in a community sense. And then we also have that economic investment um, of those dollars rotating through our local economy. So we are very glad that there are a lot of benefits that we can now look at that are peer reviewed. And I am recognizing that this clicker has stopped working. There we go. <laughs> so you don't have to hear me talk. This is just a short video um, about from some of our Wisconsin Farm to School partners to give a better sense of how these relationships work. The school district of Janesville is about 11,000 students. We have 21 different facilities that we serve. I was fortunate enough to meet Chris Blakeney with Amazing Grace Farms, and he's been invaluable to us. We started, what, three years ago now? Yeah. Uh, with an acre of broccoli, and we've grown into about uh, 10 acres of broccoli this year. 
and we're expanding probably to 15 or so next year as well. The biggest thing for us is broccoli, but of course we're doing bell peppers and cucumbers and zucchini. It's a great connection to have. It offers me a place to sell my produce and, and, and you a place to get it local. One of the big barriers that we ran into was the distribution factor. How could I project how many bunches of broccoli I'm going to need from Chris each year? And then we had 21 different sites we have to deliver to. So I had conversations with a company who minimally processes and also distributes fruits and vegetables commercially to restaurants in southeastern Wisconsin. Showed them the product that Chris was growing. They thought it was outstanding quality product and they were interested in purchasing it. So in our conversation said, well, let's have them help minimally process it. Use the florets of the broccoli for the school district because they love them. Use the stalks of the broccoli for broccoli slaw that they can sell commercially to restaurants. The best thing about it is that they could commit to buy the entire crop from Chris. It, it made it a win-win situation truly for both of us. Having our products um, grown and, and processed and distributed and then served locally is the biggest driving force of what we're doing these days. Um, we've had a CSA for nine years, you know, have the local community um, share in the bounty of the farm and this is just a way to do that on a, a large scale. This distributor distributes to a lot of the different school districts. We discussed the difficulty that a lot of schools were having getting into farm to school. So one of, one of our ideas that we had had was let's identify the products there's amazing Grace products. So now we have 67 school districts who have the ability to get amazing Grace broccoli, amazing Grace zucchini. So they've got the ability to do a little bit of farm to school in their own school system too. And to be able to identify the farmer and the farm where it's coming from is, is huge. And it also helps grow the market. So it also is better for Chris so that he can grow more each year. Um, and it just helps. It's, it's been a growing movement over time. It has taken time, but, the, but it's developed. It's only, only up. Yep. Only yep. It's, it's the upside is unlimited. It's just uh, huge potential here. So pictures always speak louder than words. Those are our two of our truest, truest farm to school champions down in Rock County from Janesville School District and Amazing Grace Family Farm. And we have really seen that partnerships have been something that make farm to school happen and that are also helping to advance this movement. And Jim and Chris have identified their own challenges and really worked together at the local level to figure out what they can do to make farm to school work for them. And then there's this amazing ripple effect where this supply chain that they have created to serve themselves is actually now extremely beneficial. The um, Madison Metropolitan School District is able to access Chris's product as well as some other institutions and restaurants in the area. Um, so what we're seeing is really Farm to School is working on multiple, multiple levels. So why does all of this matter? I've showed you a lot of pictures of really cute kids eating nutritious <laughs> food and told you how impactful these kinds of programs can be. But what does it all matter? And what we're seeing really is that Farm to School is very strong in Wisconsin, but we're also at a little bit of a turning point. When Farm to School started, there was this very iconic image of a local grower rolling up to the back of his school in a pickup truck carrying a crate of potatoes to a food service director in the morning. And that was the ethic of Farm to School, this direct connection between a grower and a school and something that felt really good. And that model still works for some school districts. But as we scale up and as we see stories and hear the things that are the needs of growers and food service directors, we need a systems change. So we're at the point of recognizing that this model needs to be expanded and looking at really creative systems approaches to do a lot of the things that Jed was talking about. How do we increase processing? How do we get growers to be growing to scale so they can enter the wholesale market? And how do we support them to the transition to 
some scary or not so scary food safety things that they might think are limiting their access to these markets. And so we're really recognizing and working hard in a lot of different ways to kind of expand this system and create new models that provide a lot of economic <coughs> development for growers and food supply chain partners like processors and distributors that help get all of this Wisconsin grown product into schools through the channels that they use. Because Jim Deegan cannot be sitting there calling seven different growers twice a week to get bids from them so he can be figuring out who is going to be pulling up to the back of his numerous food service operations in his district. So we are at a point where we're recognizing that there are efficiencies that we want to be working with in the system to get this amazing product to students, to schools, to early care centers, to hospitals, and figuring out how to do that. And partnerships are a big part of this. Um, so there are a number of levels where Farm to School works in the state. Um, there's, it's an extensive network. We are a network for sure. And I see many faces of partners on that network in the room here today. Um, and so there's sort of some state level work in leadership. There is, um, well, let's just go to the next slide here. So Wisconsin Act 293 was passed in 2009, and it created an official Wisconsin Farm to School program that's housed in the Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection. The most important thing that came out of that was a program director, which was a full-time position dedicated to farm to school and food systems, somebody who could be there to answer the phone when a school district had a question, who could talk to growers who were trying to figure out the food safety regulations, and really more than just being that person, it was a forward thinking position to say how can we really align everything that's going on and move farm to school forward? How can we help move these food systems, these supply chain partnerships forward? And Act 293 has made tremendous strides for farm to school in Wisconsin. And so we're very, very, very grateful um, that that act was passed and has become something that has been valuable in the state. I don't think we would have seen the growth of farm to school in the state without Act 293. Um, there's policy impacts for farm to school. So a lot of the things that are policy impact our ability to get local food to schools and to get our partners to be able to buy local foods or sell to schools. So the farm bill obviously affects the ability of local product to get to school. And then we also have child nutrition reauthorization, um, which at the federal level is what enacts a lot of the policy around what kids are eating, what the regulations are, and that's where farm to school is housed at the federal level. Um, and also in Wisconsin with Act 293 and things like Buy Local by Wisconsin, which really promote the supply chain development and provide support for growers and entrepreneurs who are looking at some of these solutions. So these are ways that we can really be supporting farm to school at the policy level by saying, yes, we, we want to be supporting the capacity for thi these things to happen. Although there's great people like Chris and Jim who are working together and making farm to school happen, it can't happen without the support of somebody who's there to sort of help guide and oversee and navigate the process and kind of hold all of the pieces together. And there is sort of that ability to hold the pieces together, but it doesn't also work without everybody else who is happening in the state. Um, at the local and the district level, there are also opportunities for policy, lowercase p policy around farm to school, and we see that in wellness policies that schools are required to have that can often incorporate farm to school, as well as procurement policy. So when a school has any language that talks about how they buy their Xerox machines or their erasers, there's also the opportunity for schools to include language about the importance of purchasing Wisconsin product. So thank you for your time today. I am hoping that we're able to sort of expand the idea of what farm to school is and why it is valuable to Wisconsin students and growers and communities. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Harold. Uh, I guess we are kind of a sweet spot when it comes to um, when it comes to these opportunities. Um, as uh, Dr. Cahoon mentioned, um, uh, what high quality and what diverse uh, vegetable um, stock we do have here in Wisconsin. So uh, glad to see that that is is moving on. Now, our <laughs> last two presenters. Um, our final speakers are both with the Department of Culinary and Clinical Services at UW Health, a regional health system that includes UW Hospital and associated clinics. Uh, Ms. Mim is a clinical nutrition specialist in health promotion with more than 15 years of 
clinical experience in cardiology and adult pediatric weight management and wellness. Ms. Ritter, wearing her uniform today, uh, is the executive chef for uh, UW Health. She oversees food production and procurement and has spent over 20 years in the food service industry, including 15 years in the healthcare sector. So welcome to both of you, and uh, please proceed how, however you would like to uh, uh, okay. go next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. This is really exciting, especially listening to the other speakers. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, as an institution, we're on the same page, and um, as far as policy goes, we're here to discuss how we've implemented um, sustainable and local food systems and purchasing at UW Health. Um, so UW Health, we service 600,000 patients each year. Uh, if you combine physicians and staff, that's another 18,000 people, uh, over six hospitals and 80 outpatient sites, which um, brings us to 2.5 million meals per year that we serve. Um, for us at UW Health, our goal is to build a responsible, policy-driven food system. And there's a huge responsibility when we look at how many people we touch every day and over the course of a year. So for us in implementing a policy and creating a policy, it really was about education, wellness, sustainable practices in our food system, as well as making sure that we were being responsible economically with local producers as well. Um, you know, our volume gives us the ability to influence broadline distributors as well as small distributors, and we can benefit other systems as well, um, other healthcare systems, school systems, government systems. And when you look at the amount of money we spend and the volume of food that we purchase every year, there's a, a big need to do it in a very smart way. And there was interesting, um, According to studies compiled by the American Independent Business Alliance, 48% on average of every purchase at a local independent business recirculates locally, as compared to 14% through a chain store or a broadline distributor. So that's huge if we can keep almost half of every dollar spent recirculating here, either in our county or in our state. So. At UW Health, we, in January of 2016, implemented a sustainability policy that was going to outline and define how we were going to go about implementing a food system. So part of that food system, or part of the intent of developing a policy, is to really be able to create a food environment that is built on sustainable and lasting partnerships that take into consideration the best needs of both um, the producers, sorry, our slide just jumped forward, both our producers as well as um, any local partnership that can be established. We need to demonstrate financial sustainability within those efforts, and we need to support um, a green environment, identifying where we're sourcing our food and how um, any food waste is utilized after the consumer. That's all a part of um, really taking a, a, a stronger look at that environment as a whole. So there is a direct link at the bottom of the slide here, which I hope um, you all will have access to as well when it's shared, that if you want to pour through the fine details of our nutrition and sustainability standards policy, it is there for you to take a look at. Um, as Ellen said, the policy um, is a all UW Health policy that went into practice as of January. So just in the past year, we've really been digging in and working um, to meet the to meet the guidelines and the, what we have spelled out within that policy, and there are things that we are learning along the way as well. Part of the intent um, for the policy is really to address this guiding triple aim philosophy related to the Affordable Care Act, knowing that we as a Department of Culinary and Clinical Nutrition Services can be a part of that complex food system, that we can truly evaluate how we can contribute to a much more positive framework within that food system itself. When we make a commitment to our food system, we can create partnerships with champions within the industry, and we can use um, creative pricing strategies and menu engineering. Um, and with that, we have witnessed over this past year a tremendous increase in consumer acceptance, if you will, as well as um, consumer purchasing towards healthier options. So that's evidence to say that people are interested in paying attention to their health, 
they're willing to put their purchasing dollars towards more healthful options, um, both for themselves as well as um, the people that they serve. When we look at what sustainability means at UW Health, we were most interested in making certain that these efforts affected every part of that food system. It impacts production. We need to impact how foods um, can be distributed within the system. Um, and the overall supply chain and what that um, supply chain has as an impact on their overall health. We set a goal which we believed was quite realistic um, but at the same time conservative in that 20% of our food system really be dedicated to environmental, economical, and socially responsible um, systems. As we move forward, our hope is that our goal or our hope and our goal is to continue to see that growing season and the bountiful harvest that we um, do get from our state. In order to decrease any out of state purchases that may happen, we want to see that growing season expand into these cold winter months. And we know that that produce is there. We just need to be um, much smarter and um, more creative and reach out to additional partners so that we can continue to feed all of the individuals that come through the walls of UW Health, whichever site that may be. So this is kind of our mission statement, if you Your will. Mic. Oh, this is um, our mission statement. Uh, we are committed to partnering with local growers and producers to source seasonal produce, artisan products, and the highest quality proteins and dairy for UW Health. Um, it truly is about partnerships and direct partnerships. You know, as institutions, we have our big distributors, but we really try to work with those big distributors to bring on uh, local products and use our buying power in a positive way. Uh, we use Cisco and they recently became a member of Fifth Season Cooperative. So now we're able to source all of our frozen vegetables locally, most organically, and get them at our front door every day through our big distributor. And then that gives smaller healthcare institutions or other customers that may use Cisco access to these products as well. So we do a lot of field trips. We love to go out to farms. We went out to, in the top left corner, uh, Vitruvian Farms in McFarland. They're an organic farm, and um, we purchase a lot of lettuce, beautiful microgreens from them, and they happen to have pigs and chickens as well. Um, but we love to go out and really talk with the farmers and try to understand. I mean, we're the eater portion of this um, presentation. You know, I'm, I'm not an agriculture student. I am not a farmer, but it's amazing to go out and really get to know them. And I was surprised to learn that farming isn't a full-time job, that a lot of farmers do it after hours when they leave their day job. So it was amazing for me to see the commitment that farmers have to have to continuing the family business, the generations. One of the farmers we work with is a fifth generation farmer and we grow, he grows um, aquaponic lettuce for us. And in going to look at this aquaponic operation, we noticed that he had these beautiful beef cattle. And we asked, well, what do you, what do you, how do you sell your, your cattle? And he says, oh, we take them down to the stockyard. And I noticed that they're pasture foraged and living very happy lives there. And we now source some of our beef from him as well. So I think it's really important to take the time to develop those very personal connections. We don't really use the term vendor. We like to use the word partner because it really is a partnership. And we want farmers to understand and producers to understand that there needs to be that commitment and that transparency in these relationships. Um, at the bottom left, we have Cadence Cold Brew Coffee. It's a husband and wife run business in Madison and they're right next door to their roasters. And they do this amazing job with their coffee. And we were one of their first accounts. I see them at Whole Foods. They're in Whole Foods now in Madison. So I was excited for them. But um, they're gonna be distributing through Cisco now as well. Our volume got to be so much that Jennifer was delivering to us and making multiple trips back and forth from her car to um, stock her product. So we put them in touch with Cisco and again, another way to grow a relationship. And I think, you know, I have this mission statement up in my office because I think it's really important for us to remember why we're doing this, why it's important. It's about the quality of the food and I can say that there is nothing that tastes better than something that's local, seasonally grown, um, it, it's, it's tough in the winter months. Uh, we still have to have tomatoes on the salad bar, but um, they're not going to taste as good as the ones we had this summer coming from 
from local farms. So it's, there's a level of transparency, a commitment from us to farmers that yes, if you grow 500 pounds of tomatoes next year, we're going to buy them from you. Um, helping local businesses, large and small. You know, we this summer probably worked with 10 different farms to get lettuce. We have a huge volume, but we don't wanna not partner with somebody because they can't meet the whole supply. We want to work with as many as possible and give everybody an opportunity to be able to participate in our food system and our program. Here are some more ways that we've kind of reached out into the community. Um, at the bottom photo there is uh, our former CEO, Dr. Grossman, who was really, um, I would say, one of our big supporters and champions in some of the changes we wanted to make in our retail venues and with our patient feeding program. He thought that we should be able to have a much better quality salad bar for l the least amount of money possible. So in January of this year, we lowered the price at our salad bar from $8.99 a pound to $4.99 a pound. And it was amazing to see that not only were we able to source better ingredients, local ingredients, but our volume increased drastically as far as visits to the salad bar. So it was interesting to see as we make these changes and bring in these products that we see behavioral changes as, in, as well in the way people eat and what they choose. And if they can get a pound of salad for less than it costs to get a cheeseburger and french fries, they're gonna pick the salad. So that was just a really big positive thing that came out. The other thing that Dr. Grossman thought would be interesting is why can't we have some of these great local chefs come to our cafeteria and cook? And we thought, okay, we'll give it a try, and came, um, we've had, oh, I wanna say eight or nine now this year, local chefs from the community come and cook in our cafeteria and share, it's a great marketing opportunity for them, it's a great thing to offer to our staff. We get about 3,500 people through our main cafeteria every day, and it's a great community outreach. So many of these small restaurants and large restaurants in Madison are doing local purchasing programs as well. So it's really a way to tie in all of what we're trying to do as an organization and reach out to these um, restaurants as well. So Chef Dave of Liliana's in the top right has been back twice, and he's coming back for a third time this year. Uh, Dan Bonanno in the bo uh, bottom right has been tw two times with us. So it, it's really been about community outreach as well and really shattering the, stere shattering the stereotype of hospital food. I think to Vanessa's point, school food gets a bad rap, so does hospital food. <laughs> and uh, we're really doing what we can to change that mindset and show people that good food is everywhere and especially at UW Health. So here are just some um, statistics, if you will. Getting back to the decrease in the price of the salad bar, we saw a 46% increase in volume after we reduced the price. Uh, so again, these changes have really caused people to pause and we hope we continue to drive people towards the healthy choices. Um, that being said, we really tried to engineer our menus so the healthy choice is the less expensive choice for people. Um, it is much less expensive to get a veggie burger or a grilled chicken sandwich with organic chicken at our grill than it is to get a cheeseburger. Um, and we have to look at menu engineering to make sure that we're just remaining cost neutral. We're gonna make money on the cheeseburger. We might be just cost neutral on the organic chicken breast or the veggie burger. But um, our coffee is all responsibly sourced, locally ro roasted and distributed. We do have Starbucks, but because um, there are some people that are dedicated to their Starbucks, but we have three or four other um, coffee manufacturers that are local that we work with as well. We moved as part of our policy to um, sustainable proteins, and we define sustainable proteins as antibiotic free. So no antibiotics ever for our beef, chicken, pork. Um, very important was humane handling and sustainable practices. We wanna make sure that the animals are being processed in a way that is humane. Um, I did get an opportunity to go to one of the facilities that processes our beef and saw firsthand how the animals were handled. And I think, again, that's important. Our partners need to know that we expect a level of transparency and um, expect a commitment that they're going to be abiding by our sustainability policy. All of our beef is sourced from Wisconsin family farms. So it, big and small, we have some farms that 
give us six to eight cattle a year. We have some farms that might send us 30 to 40, but all of them come from Wisconsin family farms. And that's something we're really, really proud of. Um, we decreased our beef purchases quite a bit when we moved to this model. We really wanted to try and do whole animal utilization. Um, when I came on board, we served beef brisket every week in the cafeteria, hundreds of pounds of beef brisket. And I'm thinking, I, I know, I don't know a lot about the whole cow, but I know that there's not that much brisket <laughs> coming off of, you know, 30 cattle a month. So we look at it as a whole animal utilization and we really let that drive our menu and engineer our menus to be responsible with what we're sourcing and how we're using it. Um, local produce, multiple partnerships. I think we purchased close or quite just over 10,000 pounds of fresh produce in June, July, and August this year. Um, we host our own farmer's market during the growing season. So we have a lot of great um, vendors come, local farmers, honey people, um, a gentleman that sells duck eggs. And um, it's a great benefit for our employees because we do it right at the end of the day so they don't have to make an extra stop. We do a CSA host site. We offer, we try to offer menus based on seasonality. Again, people always want tomatoes, but we really want to try and do a better job of marketing what seasonal eating looks like and correlate the seasonal eating with the sustainable practices. Uh, crop forecasting, again, working with farmers to let them know that we are committing to purchasing from them so they can forecast and take into account our volume and hopefully continue to grow our partnerships with them. And what's been really interesting too is looking at a lot of the alternative uh, means of growing. Uh, we work with some aquaponic farmers and hydroponic farmers, which has been great because through the winter months we're still able to offer those beautiful microgreens and lettuces at our salad bar and to our customers. And it would be great to see that kind of alternative means of growing grow. Um, I think it's expensive. The farmers that I've talked to, I know aquaponics startup is extremely expensive and it's a big out of pocket expense for a lot of farmers, but it really means a lot when we can still offer those local products in the non-growing season. And finally, I mean, we're in Wisconsin, so 85% of our cheese is sourced from Wisconsin, and I think that number's even closer to 90% now. Um, we really wanna be at 100% for that, and um, all of our milk is sourced from Minnesota and Wisconsin family farms as well. So these are just some things that kind of bullet point what it means in food product, but again, encompassing what it means to be sustainable and um, local in our food system at UW Health. And I'll stay on this slide just for a moment, simply to weave in um, the culinary as well as the clinical aspect um, that go into the menu engineering, where we're sourcing our products from. Um, specifically, the sustainable proteins. Um, we had worked with um, infectious disease in order to truly identify moving to that um, realm of sustainable proteins that are antibiotic free and certainly the humane handling practices are an element of, a strong element of that as well. But we needed to poultry at this point, um, if that truly would make an impact for the individuals um, from a patient care perspective as well as um, the 3,000 to 3,500 individuals that come through our main cafe daily. And the overwhelming response was yes, this is a tremendous move um, and a step in the right direction. So making that commitment and being thoughtful in all perspectives, not just from a culinary perspective, um, is truly what's driving um, this movement as well. So I wanted to share, um, there are many individuals in this room that do know about the Wisconsin Healthy Hospitals and Clinics Community of Practice. Um, this is um, a community of practice of 23 different healthcare facilities that are all working in some element of this movement as well to truly influence and positively impact the food systems as a whole. We have two different branches of community of practice. One is healthy hospitals, and much of the movement and momentum there is related to the food system, how um, items are being sourced, um, what kind of activity is available within the system? Are there walking routes available for patients, visitors, as well as staff? So that it's a tremendous opportunity for us to be pioneers in really delivering and really working on a policy-driven food system. 
there's a tremendous amount of sharing and collective learning that is happening within these cohorts and it's exciting to see what type of reach we are really um, it's extending throughout the state of Wisconsin. And with that, the partnerships that have been established, because there are so many very passionate individuals that are working on these initiatives, um, it's an honor to be a part of that. And as, a, as healthcare institutions, that we can not only be a part of the process of healing when someone is ill, but truly be a part of the prevention aspects as well. So there's a little bit of shameless um, <laughs> <Self> promotion <laughs> <laughs> because I think we also need to be creative in our opportunities to share um, nutrition education um, as um, we heard already is that the medium in which we learn is not just um, what peer-to-peer -peer interactions or simply by patient care interactions. We can be learning in a wide variety of opportunities and social media um, quite recently is one of the best ways in order to do that. So um, we use social media in order to um, draw attention to the local um, growers and producers, the local artisans um, that are coming and creating partnerships with us, as well as build in um, a fair amount of nutrition education that's there as well. I think people inherently um, recognize that healthier eating makes them feel well and makes them feel very good, but we want to also um, break down some of the barriers to that as well, showing them that affordable food is possible, that food that's prepared um, without loads of salt is actually palatable, um, and that eating seasonally in our state um, can be a really exciting adventure as well, as well as eating culturally. I appreciate that aspect as well to draw that in. So, I just want to point out, so the picture of the state of Wisconsin is in front of our Four Lakes Cafe at the main hospital, and we put that up about a year ago, maybe a little less, and we highlight some of our vendors. There's a lot more vendors on it now. Um, because I think it's important for the public to see, and by that I mean our staff, our visitors, our patients, um, to see what we're trying to do and the commitment we have to a local sustainable food system at the hospital. And it's great to make all of these changes, but it doesn't have the impact if you don't share those changes with the people that you're servicing. And we have people, we get calls all the time now, you know, my aunt has a chicken farm and her chickens are soy free. <laughs> or, and Megan, our director, gets the brunt of those calls. But um, it's, it's great to see it's about outreach. It's about networking, opportunities like this, opportunities just to share with your customers every day the strides that we're trying to make as an institution to um, make responsible choices, responsible sourcing. And it's, it's a big piece of, I think, why we've had a lot of success is we've really had the buy-in and we've been consistent in the verbiage that we use, in the marketing tools that we use, and you know, to Amy's point, in utilizing social media. And we do tasty style videos now and recipes. And it's amazing to see people even outside of UW Health are following us and we're getting a lot of positive feedback. So just wanted to note our map. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the for that presentation. Um, get your questions ready. Uh, there's a mic that's going to be passed around, so <laughs> let us know if you have a question. Uh, just a just a comment um, to start with. Uh, legislators are all about wanting to know about the the evidence based uh, policies that that we can look at. So uh, bringing to us this kind of information is, is valuable as a legislature. And you can see that we have uh, three phases here of um, uh, taking a look at this, this type of operation. We have, we have the source and the logistical challenges. Um, we have um, uh, uh, Vanessa Harold, who was talking to us about how to develop different partnerships. And then we had the example of uh, UW Health and how they are uh, really making this a, a cultural change uh, throughout their institution to be able to, to do these type of things and, and uh, people are learning to like it, which is a great thing. Uh, now you mentioned, um, you, you mentioned not being uh, bashful about you know, promoting something and, and you, mentioned, you mentioned some of the, the aquaponics and so I will very proudly mention a um, aquaponics um, 
uh, operation that is in my district in Montello, who's been there for um, about five, six years now, um, Nelson and Paid, who actually do this as demonstration products, projects, although they do source um, uh, vegetables to uh, two of our local school districts, Westfield and Montello, uh, they actually have aquaponics kits that people can um, purchase for individual use, institutional use, school use, and uh, they've actually partnered with um, UW Stevens Point to do um, uh, a certificate in how to do aquaponics. Um, they have had, they just celebrated last month, um, the 100th country, uh, someone from the 100th country that has come to learn about their process and their, um, uh, their aquaponics um, processing. And the other part that we didn't talk about in the presentations today is um, those aquaponics um, um, uh, opportunities uh, use tilapia um, <laughs> as part of their um, sourcing for their, um, uh, for their fertilizer, for, mm -hmm. the, for the vegetables and how we really need to do more in being able to source uh, that type of product mm -hmm. uh, into the market um, in all of the United States and in our, in our schools also. So with that, I didn't see anyone jump up and down. Oh, we'll go to uh, Representative <laughs> Colsty first, and, and please make sure you uh, hit your mic, and then uh, Representative Sandy Pope also has a question. Representative Colsty. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for being here. It was, you know, you, you did a good job representing how important this is to everybody that touches your programs. But here in the Capitol, we have the ability. So I guess we need to know, is there any state policy or reg rule or regulation that impedes the growth of these programs? Or conversely, is there something that is in the purview of state legislation that would help? And you may not be able to answer that right now, but certainly your professional organizations um, should get a hold of us and let us know because um, the evidence was obvious today that this is these are valuable programs and I was also thank you um, doctor for uh, I also am fit in all three of these categories we have I manage a farm out in um, western Kansas and I thought Wisconsin is really unique and that it offers you know has so many fruits and vegetables and and consumables as opposed to just things that have to be processed like for silage or whatever, corn or soybeans and those kind of things, wheat. So um, thank you for your presentations and please let us know and if, you, if anybody has any suggestions right today that would be, they'd be well taken. Any comment for Representative? No? Then we'll go to uh, Representative Pope. Yes indeed, thank you. It was a very interesting morning so far. Um, in my 14 years here, I've, I've run into some challenges that maybe you can help me with. Um, one of them is, well, for example, tomorrow I'm going to be in front of 100 fourth graders. <laughs> it bothers me a great deal to know that 12 of them in the state of Wisconsin are going to be hungry. That shouldn't happen. Um, over the years, I have been invited to some of our schools to observe what happens in the lunchroom. And I am appalled at the food waste. And I'm not blaming the children, nor am I blaming the food service providers, but it's the regulations that says the food has to be thrown away. So over the years, I've known of schools who kind of wink and nod and set that food out for the local pantry to pick up at the back door because regulations prevent them from taking an unopened carton of milk that went from the food service table to the child's table and came back and must then be thrown away. That's ridiculous. And the invitation has come from the children. Second graders in particular sent me packets of please don't waste food. We have hungry people in our community who could use it. Um, so I think that's something that we perhaps could have some, some say in, uh, but it isn't just state regulation, it's federal regulation, and I think we need to address that as legislators because it's nearly criminal to see how much food, untouched, still in the package, 
gets thrown away. Um, that was one thing. And then over the years, I have introduced bills that say the state of Wisconsin must purchase meat that was produced without routine antibiotics in the feed. And the reason I haven't been able to get it passed is because there's no way to prove that. Evidently, after X amount of time, meat cannot be tested to see if there was antibiotics there. Um, I think that's another piece that we need some help with because I'm still committed to wanting to do that, um, not just for the meat, but because of what happens to the, the waste from those um, operations where it ends up. And I, I know there are studies that indicate we have way too many antibiotics in our water system, in our groundwater. And then the third thing that I'd like to know, um, I believe it was Ms. Mim who had mentioned um, in one of the bullet points, um, socially responsible food system. What is a socially responsible food system? When we speak of socially responsible food system, I think it's taking a look at that full circle effect, um, how we relate to the grower producer. Um, is that a sustainable relationship with that grower producer? Not that, um, not that we're giving the lowest amount or back to that farm in how we're purchasing, whether it is cattle or whether it is produce, but that we are being um, financially responsible with that um, grower producer as well. So it's really looking at that that whole piece and how it relates to both our system as well as it how does it benefit um, and that farm and the community. Okay. Thank you. I, and I too am, you know, a part of all three. I grew up on a small family dairy farm, 30 some head of cattle, which is now a, a nearly organically um, produced lamb operation, hundreds of lambs. And um, it's been just, you know, tremendous to see what that takes in terms of uh, producing that kind of meat, but uh, you know the family is absolutely committed to it, and it's you know it's important to me that this continues and grows, and so I'm really appreciative of your efforts to help inform us today. Thank you. Very good. So, do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, yes, can please I go ahead. Respond to that, go ahead. Representative. Thank you for bringing up such valuable issues. Um, I know a lot of partners would be interested in working on the food waste issue at a policy level and be happy to continue those conversations. As to the antibiotic piece, there's some interesting work happening nationally that's looking at responsible antibiotic use in school foods. And School Food Focus has created a new USDA audit that's called the it's CRAU, Certified Responsible Antibiotic Use, and I'd be happy to talk with you more. Um, but it basically looks at it sort of through that audit level um, of production processes, similar to like an organic audit or a food safety audit, to look at the systems approach instead of testing a product after it's already on the plate. But I'd be happy to talk more. Yeah, we have to keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Do you have anyone else in the audience? We've got plenty of time. We actually have a question coming in online, uh, and it's, it's Go right ahead, Sam. for Vanessa, um, asking for further comment on the uh, farm to uh, prison and farm to college pieces that you mentioned in your in your presentation. So if you could <coughs> add any perspective on that, I think that would be appreciated. Absolutely, and that's an area where we're not working necessarily directly right now, but would love to. Um, looking at the farm to prison piece, and I'm not going to get all of the names right, and I apologize, but I know that um, Dane County Extension is working with a youth grow program in Oregon um, to work with the youth there in an educational program where their curriculum is agricultural based um, while they're spending that time in the facility. So it's not necessarily looking as much at the procuring product, but it, the education piece, just like any other setting where folks can be using that time learning being related to food and agriculture. As to farm to college, there are some really, really amazing things that are happening in the state, both in the UW system and also in some of the private colleges and universities. We're looking to get more involved with that work, but we know that it is happening. Um, UW-Madison is doing some amazing work in terms of who they're purchasing from and trying to make those be more local as well as more responsive to the needs of the students. And I think we're trying to develop those relationships to kind of leverage some of the statewide farm to institution purchasing into UW. Um, Stevens Point and a lot of the other universities that are part of the UW system are really, um, much like the aquaponics, um, engaging in that food systems at the 
curriculum level as well as in the food service level. And I think we'd like to be able to leverage some of those connections to take what we've learned for the K-12 and early care environment and translate it more to college. But I'd be happy to talk further with anybody who's interested in those relationships. <clears throat> now, I know that uh, Wisconsin Farm Bureau and Farm Bureaus across the United States have um, uh, school programs where they go in to talk about um, agriculture um, to help kids learn how, um, um, you know, where food comes from. Um, they and 4-H um, organizations in our high schools do um, uh, farm tours and things for, for younger folks. Are there any of those types of uh, institutional um, organizations that that either of you are working with to um, help them bring their message or to, to merge what you're doing? I can speak a bit to that. Uh, there is a lot of work in that area, of course, uh, representing uh, the strengths of agriculture in our schools and such. And I, I think there are a couple of key components to that. Number one is connecting people to food and where it comes from, given that between 1 and 2 percent of our population is involved in agricultural production. Uh, so continuing that dialogue, making them aware of the opportunities in agriculture uh, in terms of career choices moving forward. Uh, it's widely thought that there are 20,000 open jobs in agriculture right now, and uh, we need to attract people to those positions. Uh, the second piece uh, related to that gets to Representative Pope's uh, comment related to food waste. I also speak a lot in uh, schools, and I think we travel the same ground in southwest Dane County quite often, uh, and I'm ashamed of the food waste that I see there also. Uh, to me, a lot of this comes down to an education at a very early age, not only about the importance of nutrition, uh, but in consumer habits. If that's where a lot of our food waste happens, uh, I think we can start uh, with the psychology of food consumption at a very early age. A great example would be the small plate challenge, Brian Wansink's work out of Cornell University. Uh, you know, our dinner plates today, uh, or our salad plates today, are the size of dinner plates a generation ago, and we fill them. We don't need to consume them from a nutrition standpoint. And oftentimes we don't, and that's what ends up in the garbage. So how do we educate uh, and support policy to educate children at a younger age, not only about nutrition and where food comes from, but how do we reduce uh, the, the waste component in our stream? And Vanessa, you had a May I comment about oh, that? Thank, thank you. Um, I don't intend to blame anybody at the school, including and especially the children, because regulations say they must have this on their tray. Mm -hmm. And they will stand right there and say, but I'm not going to eat it. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. And they have to take it anyway. That's some of the, the regulation that I hope we are able to, to change. OK. And Vanessa? Yep. Um, their Ag in the Classroom does play a really important role in this as well as do some of the Ag education programs and there's some really neat merging of Ag Ed and Farm to School in the Holman School District specifically. They um, ran this amazing program where their food service director and their Ag, ag Educator partnered up and sort of through the summer months some of the school food service budget was used to purchase baby chicks laying hens that students then raised over the summer um, and then in the fall those were processed as a licensed facility and then brought back to the school through their existing distributor and then served to the whole entire district and possibly also I think maybe at a community meal. So they're really really interesting ways of kind of incorporating the more traditional ag ed into how school food is used and how that food can then be incorporated back into the community in the way that students can really, really see it directly. And I believe they were paid fair market price for their birds, so they were also sort of seeing those, those benefits of this is what an agricultural economy looks like and these are the perks of me becoming a professional farmer or being part of the food system when I emerge as a professional after school. So there's lots of really neat ways that those programs are being merged. And Ms. Mim has a comment. I'd like to speak also to the comment of um, children grow up and their finicky behaviors <laughs> often follow them. So what we're trying to do within our system is to be able to show people 
that food doesn't have to be the same way, look the same way each and every time they come to the cafe. So we've had a wildly successful and somewhat surprising um, endeavor called um, My Plate, where people have flavor my plate, where people have been able to try food from all around the world. And we have a very diverse um, culinary um, system, and we've been able to use recipes from the individuals who are working in our facility to share family family recipes, and then we taste test those, and individuals are really excited about what's coming next, and they look forward to what the Flavor My Plate theme was. Um, so it allows them to try new foods, try new flavors. Um, it's tremendous the amount of tofu our system consumes. <laughs> We laugh now about um, 250 pounds a week, I think, is the, the running total where people are enjoying tofu. So we have um, the opportunity to create food diversity and an appreciation for that cultural diversity. We have an opportunity to really be more plant forward when we're thinking about um, what we're consuming as well. So it's a, it's a great opportunity for learning just coming into the cafes. Very good. And we have a question from the audience. Great, thanks so much. Um, thanks for an interesting presentation this morning, everyone. Vanessa, I have a couple questions for you. So you had mentioned the Janesville School District and Holman. What are other school districts that are, I guess, leaders in the state with a farm to school movement? Then another question, what is the primary obstacle for schools to get into it or expand their farm to school operations? And then with that DATCAP position that you had mentioned, is that person just kind of serving as a, I don't know, resource for questions or are they actively searching out school districts to, again, start or expand their farm to school operations. Thanks. How much time do we have? <laughs> that was a lot of really wonderful questions. Let's see, where to start in terms of leaders? That map that I showed that had the school districts um, by color, that's actually an interactive map that lives on the DATCAP Farm to School website. So I would encourage anybody, especially legislators who's looking to see what's happening in my area, you can actually go to that map click on school districts and see what's going on. Um, there are so many leaders in the state doing things in so many different ways. There are folks like Plymouth School District who are raising hogs with students and using that in the lunchroom. There are people who are going just crazy with what they're doing with school gardens and either using that for snacks or taste testing or in the lunchroom and all kinds of amazing curriculum opportunities that biology teachers are using and developing new curriculum that then others in the state can use. So really when we say there is no one farm to school it's because there's incredible diversity uh, that schools can look at what their capacity and opportunities are and then kind of go down that path that suits them best. As to primary obstacles, they have really changed over time. And what we're really seeing now is we're seeing a lot of willingness. People, food service directors, see that this is a good thing and they want to do it, and that there's challenges around sourcing products. So that's a lot of our work is to really help align the product with the ways food service directors are buying their food already. So it's really hard. You have procurement regulations. You have to get a certain number of bids to call a whole bunch of farmers. So how can we streamline that process so that local growers are able to get their product to schools more efficiently, either through existing supply chains or new ways that we can kind of look at together? Um, one thing that we're actively trying to tackle is this, um, this feeling that there aren't enough recipes to use. So School food is really complicated, and food service directors are amazing, knowledgeable, wonderful saints, but they have to not only make the food, but they have to make it fit really, really specific requirements. So their menu has to make sure that it serves a quarter cup of a red-orange vegetable in each serving. And so making sure that we have developed the tools so that they have enough resources that feature seasonal Wisconsin produce to get to their students. And we've created some great resources around that, like the Chop Chop series. Um, so I would say those are two of the biggest things that we're hearing right now on the procurement side of things. As to um, DATCAP, um, that's an interesting situation right now. The person who was in that position was really broadly working on farm to school, taking phone calls, forward thinking, looking at the food system in general. Unfortunately, that position is vacant right now, and there's no indication that it is going to be filled until the next budget cycle has been sorted out. And I think that right now we're definitely feeling a significant loss in capacity. Um, we're struggling to maintain our programs as they are right now, um, instead of really being able to kind of help them grow at the level that they were before. Okay, uh, another question? Please proceed. Yeah, um, so I have a, 
another question specifically for Vanessa, um, but I'd also like to expand it to everybody. Um, for Farm to School, I was wondering how, what are the financial implications of this for the school districts? Because um, I'm sure, as most of us know, um, pushing towards more sustainable practices oftentimes cost more money. Um, and how is that um, difference being um, equated throughout the system? That's a great question. I can give the Farm to School answer, but I definitely want to hear the UW Health answer as well. There is the preconception that local food or Wisconsin grown foods might be more expensive. What we're really finding is that when schools are strategic about how they use their commodity dollars, how they buy their other produce, and what they're buying in season when it's really in season, that it actually doesn't have negative budget implications and in some ways it can actually help save money. Um, the real plus side, and this was touched on in one of the slides, is that farm to school is shown to increase school meal participation. So more kids are choosing to eat at their schools, which when you look at a school lunchroom like a, cafe, like a restaurant, that's then increasing the revenue that the school food service department has towards their operations, towards purchasing local foods, towards um, staff to maybe do the extra processing that's required when you're getting in whole product that's not coming in minimally processed or processed in the way the schools are used to. So it actually ends up being a lot more budget neutral in a lot of ways and farm to school overall can have a positive impact by drawing more students and also teachers into the lunchroom to be buying school lunch. But I'm really curious what your on the ground interpretation is. Um, and I would agree with most of what you just said. Um, I think when we started to make changes, we had the assumption that purchasing local products um, were going to be more expensive. And two things that we've tried to do and that proved to be correct were um, really doing the education piece and eating seasonally and engineering our menus on local seasonal produce. Um, to buy tomatoes right now from Mexico or Arizona is going to be very expensive. So we really try to look at our menu very carefully um, and buying direct. We found with a lot of our produce purchases, local farmers um, that we worked with, that we were paying less than we would have through our main produce distributor because even though our produce distributors in Milwaukee, the lettuce was coming from California and we were able to get a superior product, much better quality for the same price, if not less. So a lot of it for us is just looking at the seasonality of items and engineering our menus to make sure that we are putting a lot of those items on our menus and offering those and doing the education piece with our customers. I would like to add to that as well, and Jed, I think you touched on this in a way I really appreciated um, about fresh versus processed and what we think of as being healthy. Our original farm to school language, I believe it said fresh and healthy local foods, and now we say Wisconsin grown foods. Um, we're, it's a focus on the whole plate, so we often think of fruits and vegetables, but it's really, it's dairy. There's a lot of milk that goes into schools and also a lot of yogurt, whole grains, and proteins. And that really extends us kind of beyond just what's fresh, but also really recognizing that schools can always handle fresh produce. And we are in Wisconsin, which means we have a limited growing season. So how can we be looking at frozen product and low sodium, low sugar canned product that is raised and processed in Wisconsin that's building our economy and really providing the foods that students still accept but are also really ready for school food service to use because bringing in a whole winter squash is a little bit intimidating compared to a frozen skinned cubed kind of product. Mm -hmm. One piece in food production just uh, related to that in general uh, in terms of food economics, oftentimes the actual food product itself is cheaper than the other pieces connected to it and most importantly in this case uh, packaging and transportation. Uh, the packaging itself is often more costly than the product within it. So, and then the second piece is related to Ellen's comment in transportation. We have a great advantage to stimulate local Wisconsin production based on our freight advantage compared to the West Coast. Transportation, even with reduced fuel prices, is still tremendously expensive and it's hard to get. It's hard to put those logistics together. So we have a, an, an ability to build on that uh, advantage in Wisconsin, having uh, 22 million mouths within 250 miles or so. And Amy. Also, I think we have been fortunate to be able to look at our food system, not from a um, 
a revenue generating system, but really that we're looking at this as a cost neutral base, is that food doesn't need to be one of the main um, service lines that's drawing in revenue. But when we really look at it from a preventive health perspective and rationally feeding people higher quality food, food that hasn't traveled and deteriorated in nutritional quality, it's a benefit whether it's an employee that's within our facility or if it's a patient or a visitor that is here. So we have a large capacity to truly impact the health through food, and that's, that's what we've um, made it a mission to do. Right. We have another question from, uh, from the audience, and this, this may be the last one, depending on uh, how many uh, participants we have here in the answer. So please go ahead. Um, my question is about that percentage, that 6% that we as Americans spend on food. I've heard that before, and I've always assumed that part of the solution is getting us to spend more money on food. So I'm wondering if that's true, if that's a true assumption. Um, and if so, what does that even look like? And, and I assume it's a cultural thing, it's a systematic thing. Um, is it getting us to be willing to spend more money on high, higher quality food? Obviously, that works for some people, but not for people who don't have the money to do that. So for anybody, but. Sure, I'll start out at least, and then I'd really value the opinion of the uh, panelists. Uh, to me, it's not about spending more on food. Uh, to me, the, the paradox or the tough piece of that is that we spend 6% of our consumer expenditures on food, yet 12% of the people in our state are food insecure. They go to bed not knowing where breakfast come, comes from. So to me, it's not about spending more. It's about connecting the resources uh, to reduce food insecurity in light of our already uh, relatively inexpensive uh, food source. So part of that relates to education about uh, and marketing nutrition more than changing how much we're paying for food. It's about what we consume with our 6% uh, more than increasing the amount of uh, funding that we're spending in that way. Anyone else on the panel have a comment on that? All right, then we do have time for one more question. Well, I'll oh. actually finish it up. And um, we found that the venue we put together is, uh, it works well to present a wide range of evidence of research, but it can be helpful also to synthesize that into some takeaways for the audience and for those watching online as they head back. So I'm hoping to hear uh, briefly from each one of you on the panel uh, one or two concepts or policy considerations as a takeaway message uh, as, as we finish up the program. Maybe we could start with, with Jed and then and move down, down the line. Sure. First of all, thank you very much for attending today and thank you very much for organizing us uh, in the room to talk about this important topic. Uh, there are a couple of pieces that come to mind in terms of our relationship with this building and policies that uh, come out of uh, Wisconsin uh, in a broad sense. And then if you have questions about specific policies that would enhance this, I'm sure that all of us would be willing to continue that conversation. In a broad sense, help us with policies that make healthy solutions invisible in our current production system. Number one, it's efficient. That's how we maintain our 6% cost for food. Number two, it contributes to the Wisconsin economy by building opportunities like we heard in Janesville and with sustainable beef production and such. And number three, it can build on our economy and providing jobs in the state of Wisconsin. We have over 400,000 jobs in agriculture, 10% of our employment. We have the opportunity to continue to grow that, whether it be with aquaculture like we heard about or and farm to school programs or in more of some of our more traditional agricultural topics. That's all part of the same solution. The second piece I would offer is uh, related to some of the comments that Amy and Ellen offered. If hunger costs us $2.68 billion in the state or over $500 per taxpayer per year, speaking as a taxpayer, would I rather put my money into regulating issues of policy or providing more stable and nutritious long-term solutions. I'd rather support long-term healthy solutions. So in that sense, let's consider supporting those longer-term solutions uh, and relating our health care to the long-term uh, nutrition more than subsidizing the outcome of, of poor nutrition. 
healthcare specifically. Let's avoid some of that conversation. I know it'll reduce business on your end, but I'm all for it. <laughs> but, uh, but let's work on the longer term solution and provide stability through our great agriculture to be able to do that. Vanessa? Thank you, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today to talk about child health and ag development. In terms of looking forward, I think there's some ways to grow farm to school through things like formalizing a farm to school month celebration in October in the state, which is something that a lot of other other states have and there's a national farm to school month recognition but a very low cost way to celebrate the things that we are doing here and also any way that we can formalize the relationship between farm to school and farm to early care and education so that when we're talking about one we're talking about them both so farm to school and farm to ece kind of moving hand in hand at the the big level i think increasing state contributions to school meal reimbursements is something that could have a huge impact on how school food service professionals are able to feed children. Some states do it tied to the purchase of local foods and some states just do it flat out as an increased reimbursement. The rate has not increased in Wisconsin in a long time and I think that could go a really, really long way to making a difference here and making food service jobs easier. Um, and then any of the work that's continuing to support ag system, food system development, things like Buy Local, Buy Wisconsin, which are really helping to build that infrastructure for growers and for supply chain partners who are looking to innovate and create new sustainable supply chains. I think those are all ways to really support the things that we've been talking about today. Amy. So I think just looking at the individuals that are in this room um, specifically, there's a tremendous amount of interest, there's a tremendous amount of passion that goes into our food systems and a tremendous amount of pride that we have for our state um, and really taking care of our um, communities very well. So I, it's maybe simply an encouragement to be a part of this in the, in the largest capacity that you can and even search out opportunities. There's been so much that I have learned just in the past year and being able to make the connections through the Wisconsin um, Healthy Hospitals Community of Practice there are lots of individuals who are eagerly a part of what we're doing, so get yourself involved in any capacity that you can. Okay, and Ellen. Um, I think for me, it's especially back to supply chain. Uh, a lot of the farmers at the end of the growing season came to us and, I mean, had an abundance of tomatoes, and we couldn't take 500 pounds of whole tomatoes. One, they're going to spoil on our shelves, but we would like to figure out a way to maybe replace all of our number 10 cans of tomato sauce from Hunts and Cisco to be local. But how do we do that? Where is the packing facility? How do we as an institution purchase those 500 pounds of end of season tomatoes and, and make that all come together? Logistically, it's very challenging as an individual organization, but I'm hoping even listening to what you're doing with um, the food bank initiative to maybe somehow get looped into that. And the other thing is um, speaking to social, socially responsible sourcing. Two of the small businesses we work with do great things in the community. One of the vendors we use, Just Bakery, we purchase cookies from and she employs individuals who have recently been released from incarceration and teaches them job skills. So not only are we getting great cookies, but we're helping her grow her um, organization. Uh, Peacefully Organic, one of the farmers that we used, he employs veterans that are returning from duty and gives them a quiet place to work and kind of readjust back to um, a normal way of life. So I think it's identifying those small groups that are trying to do amazing things and doing whatever we can from a state level and local level to really help them continue to do the great work that they do. Thank you, and I'll, I'll throw it back to Sam in just a just a second. But I would I would like to uh, just I don't know make a a plug for um, what's happening in production agriculture over over many years now. Um, uh, you're seeing so much more. You talk about efficiency. Uh, you talk about what it takes to actually get that product out of the field. Um, the transition that's gone into uh, uh, conservation tillage and, uh, and no-till planting has reduced the number of passes over the field uh, to, uh, you know, bring the product to market. Uh, and technology, uh, using um, uh, GPS technology to make sure that um, every, 
every crap is um, is uh, the optimum in uh, being uh, harvested. Um, in the 40 years that since we've been in, in business, um, it used to be that all the canning factories uh, in the area were canning factories. And now if you take a tour of the canning factory, they're still canning, but they're doing a whole lot more when it comes to um, what the process is that they're using to uh, reduce sodium and, and some of those things. Um, canning factories that are have been transitioned to um, uh, freezer processing, mm -hmm. uh, so that is uh, huge nowadays. And in the in the old days, uh, you used to see the pickup truck uh, with the tomatoes and the sweet corn in July and August. But now there is a, a much greater industry in providing fresh uh, products uh, to the market, not only locally, but um, you have some great examples here in here in Madison with uh, uh, on Wednesdays and on Wednesdays and Saturdays you can get just about anything you want uh, right around the square. So um, um, we have, and uh, probably you folks that are familiar with um, uh, UW Extension in Green Lake County, uh, the last couple of years there's been just an awesome. Um, uh, produce auction that's been going on where uh, local folks are partnering actually with um, uh, farmers in our Amish community uh, to do some things. Uh, so there is a lot going on uh, from the producer side, from the UW side, and what we've seen here today is that you really can develop a culture uh, that can use these these things for uh, not only better use of our of our food products, but also for our health. So with that, I'm sure Sam is going to tell us how we can get access to the slides and materials and contact information for our wonderful panelists. So uh, thank you all today, and we'll go back to Sam. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, a couple last things. Uh, noted the, I don't know if you can pick up on the video feed, but there was some noise from the ductwork. Apologize if that was distracting for anybody in the room. I it took was it bringing as, us heat. I it's took okay. it as evidence. <laughs> the building was presenting us with evidence that the heat was working. So that was, that's a good thing. Um, if you haven't done so, please fill out that green evaluation form. We'll have some of my colleagues at the doors to pick it up, and if you miss them, you can leave it on the table uh, by the, where you picked up your folders. Uh, the materials and links to the video for today's um, proceedings will be posted on our website at www.evidencebasedhealthpolicy.org, uh, uh, and will also be emailed to everybody who is um, registered or in attendance today. So if you are um, aren't registered, make sure to do so on your, on your walkout and leave an email address so we can get that to you. Um, on our website, you'll also be able to find information on past briefings and on our next briefing on January 11th uh, in this room, um, which will deal with the future of the Affordable Care Act and uh, the Medicaid program. So a slightly different topic than what <laughs> we're dealing with today. Um, You're going to bring your crystal ball for that one? <laughs> that's the plan, yes. <laughs> Today's discussion uh, adds to the ongoing dialogue on both sides of State Street between the campus in the Capitol, uh, and it's not possible without the engagement of our legislative partners, um, our panelists, and the audience. Uh, so thank you all for being involved in supporting the project. Um, thank you very much. Have a great day. and hope to see you back here on a hopefully warmer day in January. Thank you. Thank you.